Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Bergen uh, Global event, uh, which is called um, Haiti and Norwegian Police Efforts um, Against Sexual and Gender Based Violence. Uh, my name is uh, Torin Winterman. Uh, I am a research director at Christian Mikkelsen's Institute, um, working on uh, rights and gender and democracy and governance. And today we have with us uh, two people, as you can see, um, Marianne Thorsen, who is a PhD candidate at, here at CMI, uh, working on uh, gender aspects of the um, uh, Haitian justice system, and um, uh, Jarle Birke, who is the police officer at the um, Western Police District here in Norway. Uh, and what are we going to talk about for this hour is uh, the occasion here is uh, Marianne has written a um, report um, which is called um, The Future of UN Policing? Question uh, mark. The Norwegian led uh, special police, specialized police team to combat um, uh, sexual and gender based violence in Haiti. Um, so we, we're going to discuss this report. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, Jale Birke has been uh, on several uh, UN missions, and he's been um, uh, leading the uh, Norwegian Specialized Police uh, Team in Haiti. Uh, so we have both uh, academic and a practitioner here, and we're looking forward to hearing um, uh, your views on this uh, particular topic. Uh, so Mariana, if you could start by telling us why did you decide to, to write about this theme? And what it, what is uh, what is it um, that you're writing in your report? Well, I choose to write, write this report because I uh, get to know the, the Norwegian uh, police people in Haiti as part of uh, of preparing for my fieldwork as a PhD. And uh, when I talked to some of these police people who had left, they uh, they I got, I got the feeling that they were curious about how these initiatives were going. Like, uh, Jarl asked me if I could just uh, step by the office, uh, the uh, sexual and gender-based violence uh, office in uh, the capital, Port-au-Prince, to just check how things were going. So, so I had this impression that, that they were kind of left in the, in the, in the, in the blank, if, if that's a word, uh, as to how this was going. Um, and I was also uh, motivated by a bigger question, like how what happens when the UN leaves? Mm. Uh, because the UN are quite interested in measuring and knowing how things are going while they are still there. But once they leave, we know very little about uh, their projects. Mm. And also this specialized police team was presented as um, a pioneering project uh, in UN policing, um, something that had never tried, been really tried before in such a thorough way. So I was also um, interested in, um, in what is special about these kinds of specialized police teams and do they work better than other kinds of police teams? But what is the difference? I mean, what was this project? What was this team? What were they doing? Uh, well, the UN uses uh, police, uh, UN policing is important for all peacekeeping missions. But what was special about this special uh, police team was that it was, it had this project-based approach and it was a, a team of police people from well, mostly Norway, but also Canada. So they had similar policing cultures and they were experts in their fields. So they sent uh, about five Norwegian police people from uh, that was specialized in, in sexual and gender-based violence investigation to, to Haiti. Um, and then they stayed for a year at a time and then they got new uh, uh, officers. So they, they stayed in Haiti for nine years. Uh, so what was spe special about this? Um, or this approach was in order to create a more um, uh, more focused uh, uh, specialization on on sexual and gender-based violence, mm -hmm. instead of having this randomly assigned group of police people who didn't know why they were there <laughs> and what they were doing. So having this approach helped the the police, uh, yeah, stay focused and also ease mm -hmm. the cooperation. Mm -hmm. So this was this was the only specialized police team in Haiti, and they worked on this topic of sexually and gender-based violence in particular. Why was that? Why did they choose? Um, 
Well, the the police in, in Haiti has several uh, challenges uh, because it's a very new police force. It was created in the mid 1990s. But um, what they saw after the earthquake in 2010 was that uh, the prevalence of sexual and gender based violence peaked, especially in the internally displaced persons camps uh, where there were very unsafe environments and um, a lot of police infrastructure had also been destroyed in, in the earthquake. So this peak in, in sexual and gender-based violence motivated Norway to, to send specialists in uh, combating sexual and gender-based violence, mm. even though sexual and gender-based violence has always existed in Haiti, but it became very evident uh, how serious it was after the earthquake. Mm. And, and what did you find in your report? Um, I found... Um, I found a lot of things, <laughs> but uh, so, so the results of the projects, if you will, are, are kind of mixed. Mm. There were many things that worked really well. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the Norwegian-led uh, specialized police team had a lot of focus on, um, on training and building the capacity of the, of the Haitian police to like change uh, how people thought about uh, around sexual and domestic violence. We must also remember that Rape had only been uh, criminalized for five years when the, the Norwegian police team arrived. So it was a, a lot of work that had to be done regarding people's attitudes and, and just taking this crime seriously. Um, so uh, uh, among the things they did was to just establish specialized police um, offices um, uh, in all of uh, Haiti's 10 departments. Uh, where they had experts in, in uh, sexual and gender-based violence. So, so this was like offices where victims could come and give their testimonies in a private uh, and safe space. And um, the offices were also sufficiently equipped. Um, the alternative was often bef before these offices were set up that the victim came uh, and had to give her testimony in front of... Um, convicts who were like placed in the in the in the room so just to give this sense of privacy that would uh, lower the threshold for people to come and file complaints um so they built all of these offices and also trained a lot of police personnel to work in these offices and they started this um, introductory one week course on sexual and gender based violence at the police academy um so since uh, since then, around 7,000 police um, uh, recruits have received uh, their training uh, at the police academy in, in sexual and the best violence. And they also established this centralized unit in, in Port-au-Prince called the Unit to Combat Sexual and the Best Violence that worked as a specialized office uh, who were supposed to, to uh, monitor and follow up on the different activities around the country. Uh, with the aim of sustaining the efforts once the, the police team uh, was gone. So those are just a few of the things they achieved. Mm. But what I found in the report, uh, unfortunately, is that a lot of these efforts are um, disintegrating mm. because when the, when the Norwegian police team left in 2019, they also left with the money. So um, it's obvious that these issues are not prioritized by the Haitian police. Um, a lot of the like of the 13 offices that were put up, only nine remains. The others have closed down or has been just looted. <laughs> so um, it's yeah, so the results are mixed. It seems that even though the police team worked hard to to uh, to provide sustainability, you you cannot do a lot of things without money. And also the current political situation in Haiti is not exactly. Uh, favorable for building a strong, mm. to building strong institutions either. Mm. And Yala, you were there for a year towards the end of this mission. I mean, what what did you? How was this mission different from the ones you've been working on previously, like Kosovo and Liberia? And can you remember, you know, what was your, what what were you trying to achieve? How were you working? What was your experiences in Haiti? Well, was that one question? Um, several <laughs> questions, I guess. Uh, I yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, uh, first of all, I would say that um, it, it's a big differences between the missions. Mm. 
it, it's good to ex have experience from one mission going to another one. But coming to the next one, you, you need to step down and, and you know, observe how this mission is functioning because uh, every mission has a has a their own commander or police commissioner mm. and uh, its own uh, SOSG, the special representative for the sector general. So the setup should be the same, but uh, my observation is that it's quite different. Mm. Uh, the mandate in, in Kosovo were more like uh, executive power. We were actually the police at the same time that we educated police in the police academy. Mm. So as soon as we had educated police at the, from the academy, we worked together with them for my one year. Uh, so, so that was kind of the same work as going at the police station here in Bergen. Mm. Um, Liberia was uh, monitoring advice. Then you go to Liberia, you don't know what to do. <clears throat> I have my education from back home, maybe some specialized courses. And after uh, induction training, they put me in whatever job is vacant. Mm. So it's more up to the mission life to, to put, reproduce the people coming to the mission. Uh, I had kind of a senior leadership experience when I, when I got to Liberia. So I was put in a, in a leadership position. So then I could use my, my background more than many could. Mm. That will always be a challenge coming from all the member states to one country. Uh, it's a difficult mission to have all people from all those countries to work together with the same culture, structure, and, and all of those. <clears throat> so I need coffee all the time. That's why I have to drink. Please. <laughs> this is the morning and the morning yeah. event. Um, <clears throat> so really coming back from uh, Liberia into a, a senior leadership position in, in my own police district, I thought really I was finished with the UN policing. But after having the call from uh, the National Police Directorate about going to Haiti as uh, head or, or project manager for the specialized team, it was kind of the same as winning a lotto because I knew about the team. Mm. I was not sure to apply. And, and that's what reason by what I've been reading about how specialized teams are working. Because I was in Liberia missing all the time the, the, the focus from the, the dedicated officers. It's nothing wrong with officers from all over the country, but it's difficult to have them uh, do the same. Mm. And uh, the mandate uh, is nothing uh, about academics, but in the headquarters in New York, I think there are way too many and they're way too good and too sharp. So, sorry, people? Yeah, yeah, the workers, because mm. when the plan hits the ground, mm. nobody understands them. Mm. It's a big challenge. Okay, so they're to too do. complicated or too... Yeah, they are technically English. Mm. Uh, if, you, if you use your, your sharpest mind, you wouldn't really understand them. And it's always a difficult to, to have uh, those big plans going from ambition to action. Mm. So that was the first experience in Haiti. I couldn't really understand what is the mission here? except uh, the project mission. Mm. You mean the, the project of yeah. the specialized team? Yeah, yeah specialized and, team. And that was, what was the mission of the specialized team? No, it's, it's more into dedicated uh, task. Mm. We were, or we have fulfilled many of the tasks when I arrived. So the last year uh, of the mission or, or the, the time left for the specialized team was more into uh, not only spending all the money that we could, on good uh, tasks, but it was uh, also to, to fulfill some of the most important, and that was to, to, um, to build a specialized unit. Mm. When I arrived, we had three officers working in a specialized unit uh, uh, within the Haitian police, mm. and that is not a solid uh, <laughs> unit. So we decided that, uh, that we are turning. That's why the first thing I did uh, was writing my own strategic plan harmonized from the mission mandate, from the SOP for the Haitian police, you know, reading all these documents, sitting together and discussing what is the, <clears throat> how can we go from ambition to action here? What should be left when we leave? And that's why we, we focused on training or having new officers in the team. We trained them, uh, the international seminar, rebuilding the, the office. 
Uh, and we really worked hard for the one year to achieve this. But of course, it's easier when you have your own money mm. to present. If the UN, I feel the UN is still the same as the, the home uh, police. That we don't have a lot of money. Most of the money goes for salary. Mm. And that's the same with the UN. Mm. So how much, since we're talking about money, how much money did you have? <laughs> what was it spent on? Is it about $2 million for all years? Yeah, I, I, I registered like around 15 million Norwegian kroners. Mm. Yeah, a little bit over 2 million US. Yeah. And that, that, was, that was also something special about this mm. project, that they yeah. came with their own funding, mm. which is not very common in, in UN peacekeeping missions. So, of course, this made it possible to, to create this long list of outputs mm. that yeah. they did. Um, so, so, of course, without the funding, they wouldn't have all of these offices, most likely. Mm. But, but what they have actually done in other um, uh, specialized police team around the, the world today, when they have, like, because this, this whole project was a very new, new approach to UN policing. Mm. So they've been constantly um, uh, uh, designing the, the, the model uh, mm. for other uh, UN peacekeeping missions, uh, drawing on a lot of the experiences from the, <laughs> from the team in, in uh, Haiti, mm. uh, but they have actually taken out the funding part. Um, so the, the specialized police teams that were, are in um, Mali and uh, South Sudan, for instance, do not have bring with them their own uh, big budget. Mm. Um, perhaps because they see that, yeah, you do create a lot of outputs, but what do you do? The, the, the country itself has to be able to maintain the, yeah. the initiatives. Mm. Yeah. So, so the money was spent. How was it spent? It was channeled through the police budget in Haiti, or was it kind of no. direct? How how no. how did it work? It's a kind of trust fund from Norwegian government mm. by the headquarters in New York into the mission. Mm. Uh, so I have to be honest to say that one of my, my biggest challenges in the Haiti was the was the UN themselves because mm. it is um, not the normal way to doing to. to put in some specialized people, calling it a specialized team. Mm. It takes years for the UN to get used to this. Mm. But we are kind of way uh, behind schedule on this because my opinion is that we, we need the specialized uh, um, teams to go around to do the task from the ambitions. From the ambitions, they write books about that in, in the headquarters in New York. Mm. So why should they write books if we can't hit the ground, do the work? Mm. And that's why it was really a dream coming true to have money. In Liberia, we had to do the activities for free or pay it ourselves. Mm. Of course, uh, as a UN officer, you, you earn more money than back home. And, and, uh, but that's the reason by being in the country. But a lot of activities in, in Liberia, we paid ourselves for the food and drinks for the, for the guest. Mm. And that was the same in, in Haiti. And when I wrote this strategic plan, it, it, it was kind of frustrating to, to see my colleagues, uh, experts from their home countries coming to Haiti, didn't know what to do. And as you get older, you start asking difficult questions and you maybe you reflect more on life. Mm. So going around asking, what is your mission here? Surprisingly, many people couldn't answer that question. No. And that's why I, I strongly believe in a specialized team that you give some specialized task, you can have more people working in it. Mm. And then I'm, I'm not sure always if you need a big amount of money, but you need some money to have a certain kind of freedom to, to move around, to start things. Mm. So, so the other uh, police, um, uh, peacekeeping police, what did they do? Um, you said a lot of people didn't know what to do. <laughs> I, maybe it's not fair to say they yeah. didn't know what to do, yeah. but uh, they were sent to Haiti. Mm. Uh, we always have a mission mandate. Mm. It's kind of clear, at least it's clear for the people on the other side, in the New York side. Mm. Um, but you need to operationalize a mandate. Mm. If you don't, it's difficult to understand. And it's really difficult to measure. Mm. We try to measure. Therefore, we know how many more or less exactly how many went to the courses, how many were female, male, mm. how many judges, the international seminars, how many people attending the four seminars or the fifth by the Canadians. Mm. 
because it, it's important to tell people that it, it works. Mm. And, and if they ask us, how, how do you know this? We can at least show them some numbers. We mm. can talk to them. Mm. And yeah, uh, didn't know what to do. Uh, we had a lot of support from the mission as well. Mm. Being within the mission gives us uh, security. It gives us uh, strength mm. to, together with the rest of the people there. Mm. I would say it would be more difficult go with, for me with uh, five other Norwegians, uh, two Canadians, two Haiti, and we were the specialized team without the camps, without the, the supplies. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, then we need to take care of our funding uh, with vehicles, uh, whatever. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. So, how was your everyday? Uh, days kind of spent there organizing? I mean, what, what do you remember from your time there that you spent the most time on? Uh, hard working. Mm. Uh, I still remember, or I can hear myself say at my office here that I'm, I'm too busy, but when I'm reflecting back to Haiti, I, I'm not busy here at all. Mm. Because in Haiti, everything was a challenge. Mm. Uh, going around, uh, having the attention of uh, the co-workers, uh, arranging the, the seminars. It, it's so much more difficult. So, so one year goes really fast. We need to put the pace on everything to, to achieve something within one year. Uh, but uh, the heat, of course, was a challenge. But when you pass two or three months, you just love it and you can't have enough. Mm. Because it's uh, that region of the world is is kind of paradise. Mm. Uh, but as soon as you go into your car and you drive out to the street, it's not paradise anymore. Mm. And, no, it's and, hard to live there. Especially yeah, now. Uh, and we knew that uh, our own security was more or less um, taken care of for some few uh, security measures, or mm. uh, the pistol you were given to take care of your own security. And that will be a challenge, as we said earlier, that going around in the world as a peacekeeper with a gun. Uh, it's needed, but uh, for me, it will it will always be a challenge. Mm. Yeah. So, so, so keep going back to the money, because <laughs> you say it's so important. Uh, and it, it's something that made this effort different from the other specialized teams. So so you spent it on, on logistics or... or not salaries, I assume, but training, or how how did the money make a difference? For example, the the police station or police office we built for the SGBV unit. Mm. Uh, we couldn't have done it without the money. Mm. Uh, we took over an old building built for some something else just before the earthquake, and then it was stopped. So we had the agreement with the, with. Um, police general or the, the police director in Haiti that we could take over the building, had a contract and a contract with the local uh, entrepreneur. So in half a year, we rebuilt it, uh, as Marianne says in the report, it's office for the whole team. Um, it's way past what they are normally used to. Mm. But we had a, a long discussion, uh, should we put in computers or typewriters? Mm. And we said, no, we can't go back in time looking forward. Mm. And I know that maybe today is not many computers left, but mm. the, due to the situation, it's easy, kind of easy to understand why people bring them outside and, and sell them and, and stuff like that. But mm. um, And the it, door is missing as well. The door to yeah. the unit was something I discovered when I was there. Someone had taken the door, mm. so which makes it very easy to go and take the computers, of course. Mm. Big metal door. Yeah. Mm. Gives mm. money. Mm. Oh, but, but these are some of the challenges uh, in Haiti, in other places. Mm. I, I guess uh, Haiti is one of the poorest countries in the world. Mm. So it, it, it's a lot of culture to understand that I can't really understand. But after being there, I can, I can see so many reasons why it's like this and why people do like this. Mm. Um, but uh, of course, money, we, the, the UN kind of leave behind some tracks. And, and that is uh, none of us go to Oslo for a seminar without having money. You will have salary, you will have covered plane, you will have uh, maybe food money. 
and we needed to pay for that in Haiti. So mm. when we collected, for for example, for international seminar, mm. uh, 200 people from all over the country, we mm. paid for the transportation, for the hotel and, and stuff like that. And that will never be in the budget for the Haitian police, I believe. Mm. Mm. Not uh, as long as I live. Maybe you <laughs> could see that. Yeah. So, so are you saying, I mean, apologize for my ignorance about uh, UN police missions, but are you saying that in, in most missions, there aren't any money for events or seminars. There's just the salaries of the peacekeepers are paid, but they have no operational budget. Some budget we have, mm. but it, it's an ongoing and it's a, it's a kind of, I would call it a long-term planning mm. because everything takes long time within the UN system. Mm. And again, I can understand, but I, I don't have the time wait for this uh, especially in my age and and you know that you have one year that you can't wait three weeks to have a a, a bill approved mm. Mm. that's why i was going, going to the office and we say yeah we're just sitting here waiting until you are done done it mm. uh, maybe it's not fair to do it but it's within the un system it's it's a lot of money all the countries in the world give money to the un and they they send people for missions different places of course they have operational budget but it, it's so difficult sometimes it, it feels to have a structure on it mm. and the mm. program and i know in in haiti they had uh, just over 30 projects going and we were one of the project uh, but i also know that the power of reporting so that's why we were more or less the only project reporting every second week, mm. because I knew it's it's power in reporting, writing small report every second week, sent to the, the mission uh, leadership, mm. telling what we are doing. Mm. When I asked what are the, the other project doing, it was really difficult to have the answer, mm. but, e even mm. though it's big money sent mm. out of the projects. Mm. Mm. But but is it there a risk that Norway, being a rich country, can kind of um, fund this uh, specialized teams in ways that perhaps other uh, countries which send peacekeepers or UN, I mean, police personnel cannot, that there is a kind of A and B team of, of peacekeepers. They're actually uh, trying to, to use that as something positive in the new specialized police team because mm -hmm. they are, they consist of one resource rich country, if you will, uh, usually a Scandinavian country. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then um, like the, the, the specialist police teams that are in Africa consist of, of Scandinavians and Africans. Mm. Uh, so peacekeepers from other uh, African countries um, where they are using the resources of the, of the, of the Scandinavian countries and then they are using the, the, uh, having the African peacekeepers to, no, sorry, police um, uh, officers to get a sense of this more local ownership mm. um, to it all. Mm. So, yes, there is there is this um, uh, risk, uh, but um, yeah, I don't know what to do <laughs> about that. And still, they're also talking much less funding now than 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 for the mm. uh, specialized police team in in Haiti. Mm. Mm. But maybe that is one of the advantages. It's like going as a Norwegian for missions. Nobody really can put a finger on anything we did in world history. Uh, it's like we are blank. Um, well, yes, maybe <laughs> up to your yeah, point. It's, it's my experience. Mm. You talk about yeah. the French, yeah. British, uh, yeah. the Americans, uh, different countries. But yeah. Norwegians, what have you done? And, and then, uh, so as long as we give them uh, respect, mm. and I feel that we mm. are trained hard before we go for UN mission that uh, no respect. Mm. We don't have, yeah, no. we don't come with the same colonial baggage, although I guess no. the history of colonialism in Norway is yet to be completely written. Mm. Um, but I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I see what you mean. And uh, of, of course, uh, it, it's not like we are the best at all. But I think we are really good in, in, mm. in cooperation with others, mm. interaction. Mm. Because that's, that's the way we work back home. And for me, every discussion with other police officers going in mission life is ending up with we are police service and most of the other police force or mm. gendarmerie. Mm. And that's more military structure. Mm. Mm. Uh, so I, I can't say it enough going around that we are for uh, the public. 
we are mm. doing service for. Mm. We are not uh, built like a military structure. And, and of course, personality will ha always have 95%, uh, I guess, of how you live your life and how you do your business. But um, I, I really seen the benefit of, of coming from, uh, of course, we are a rich country and we're coming from a free country, but also we have a lot of respect among ourselves. Mm. Mm. And going back to the results of this project, um, I mean, there was trainings and units built. Was there any indications uh, that it had effects on reporting patterns or uh, the the ways that the police dealt with uh, sexual and gender based violence cases? Um, well, that that was one of the of the things that the, the specialized police team hoped to see. That mm. uh, there there would be an increase in the number of reported cases mm. because that doesn't mean that there's more sexual violence. It means that the people are actually uh, to taking their cases to to the police mm. um and uh, but the problem with doing research and investigating things in haiti is the unreliable statistics mm. um there were the, the specialized police team one of the things they did was to install this case registry system on on computers so that the police station would reg actually register um uh the cases um but one of the things I found in the report is that they are not really using that at all. And uh, so, and what the UN did when they were present in Haiti was to, to drive around in all the police stations and, and manually um, gather all the, the reported cases to keep their statistics. Mm. But as the mission was downscaling first in uh, 2017 from uh, MINUSTA, which was a um, stabilization force, mm -hmm. to MINUJUST, which was... Um, um, Still, uh, 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 under the justice, yeah. yeah, more focused on on the justice mm. system. Mm. Um, they lost personnel, or they they scaled down. And and one of the tasks that went out of their uh, mandate was collecting these kinds of statistics. So actually, mm. after 2017, we don't know much about the uh, sexual and gender based violence statistics in Haiti, which mm. makes it very hard to to measure the effects of these kinds of efforts. But one thing that uh, that can say something is that um, uh, the, um, during uh, when the UN was collecting the statistics, they found that one of their initiatives, the um, One Stop Center, that mm. they had uh, at the hospital in the north, where victims could come and um, report their cases while getting uh, healthcare for um, uh, sexual and gender-based violence. And, and in, in that department, the, the number of uh, reported cases uh, doubled, uh, where in the other departments, it was stable. So it, it, there is some indication that some of the initiatives, at least the one-stop center, worked quite well. But then again, after 2017, we know nothing. Mm. Yala, did you see any indications when you were there um, of effects of changing um, investigative practices or reporting patterns and realizing it was, just, it was just a year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, I, I read the reports from the, the colleagues before me and I saw the challenge that educate some, uh, where do they go when they are educated? Where do they move after being, uh, having the course and uh, the, the personalized uh, capacity building is always difficult because you need to travel a lot around the country and it's difficult. It takes uh, a day or two to go up north mm -hmm. and the same to go south, even though it's not further than uh, maybe yeah, 10 miles, 100 kilometers. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's difficult. And, and the challenge we met where that we were really in the downsizing phase in the end of the mission, uh, still having a lot of money left. So I, I, I didn't have the goal of spending all the money, uh, just throw it out the window. So therefore we, we wrote this report. And I saw from the activities that uh, maybe the most important activity was to have the uh, ULCS or the SGBV team mm. up and go again. Mm. Because leaving Haiti with a specialized focus on not having a team was kind of a, for me, uh, a big failure. So that's that's why we worked hard. But I would say the, the one activity 
uh, that maybe was the cheapest one was the workshop activity. Uh, a two-day workshop there where I brought this activity from Liberia. We did the same there. It's like you go to Bergen, you call it, you collect the 20 most important people. How can we prevent SGBV cases? What will you do? How will you work with the police? Mm -hmm. And how will you take care of the victims? So that was kind of amazed to see the result in just by, by having a really strong female judge that was into more or less everything we did. Mm -hmm. It was our lucky day, the day we found her and she agreed to work with us because uh, I had contact with her <clears throat> even yesterday evening just to ask how life is. But mm. yesterday was the, the first time I heard her say, life is a hell in mm. Haiti now. Mm. So it's, it's going from up there, activities down to now, it's crazy times. Mm. But just say that this activity was the first time I heard both in Liberia and in Haiti, uh, and I didn't know Maggie very well when we started, but after the judge, yeah, mm. the judge, yeah, mm. uh, saying that this was the the first activity she actually saw some result from, mm. because we had twenty people. Uh, it was different religious leaders. You can find most of it in, uh, in Mariana's report. But the power of the police, the judges, uh, the the priest, the voodoo priest, uh, uh, the mayor sitting together and even a journalist sitting together in two days meeting mm. and discuss it it was powerful mm. and there was the police and the judge telling them what to do and maybe that was one of the criticism for for the UN that we more or less go around in the world and tell people what their problem are mm. before we know what it is mm. so, so this activity is the others the other way around that we mm. go to them and ask what to do Mm. And the judge and the police chief tell us what or how to do it. Mm. And what did they say their problems were? I mean, from, from their perspective, uh, what was the main challenges in addressing this issue? Oh, a lot of them. Of course, it, it's mm. a really weak justice chain. Mm. Uh, even though you, if you get the case or you get arrested, you probably be sent to jail without a court sentence. Because it, it's a difficult system. And I saw exactly the same in, in Liberia. I visited the prison there and the, the sign was like three sign or five, meaning how many years I've been to prison without a sentence. Mm. So a lot of people, you know, they, they just gave up because within the, the prison, they had at least food. Mm. So maybe it's easier to be there than outside. But the, uh, uh, and of course the SGBV unit, being a national unit uh, without <laughs> cars, mm. fuel, mm. Uh, power. Mm. So where to start? When I came there, I, 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 I smiled driving from the airport because I felt the same uh, smell as Liberia, more or less the people looking the same. It's giving an impression I'm coming back home. Mm. to Liberia, but now it's Haiti. Uh, but it's also the same challenge. They don't have anything mm. compared with us and, and where to start, what, what to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things I found in the report as well, that, that the training has worked in the sense that NGOs working on, on um, with women, uh, female victims of, of sexual and gender-based violence, they, they could report that these, these police officers who had gained uh, received the training and there was a su substantial difference with them and, and the, to those who didn't receive the training. So they said that victims are very well um, uh, welcomed when they come and you can feel an empathy in the way they interview them. Mm. So they gave a lot of positive assessment, but then they said, but the cases doesn't lead anywhere mm. um, because they don't use their case registry, registry system. So they have to remind them constantly you remember that case mm. <laughs> that you were doing? Mm. And also they don't have the resources to follow up mm. because they cannot go out to the crime scene to, to investigate, for instance, because they don't have cars, they don't have uh, ne necessary equipment to, to do the investigation. Mm. So it, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, it matters, but it matters less how people are received if they cannot get justice because the, the cases fall, uh, fall through. Mm. 
and uh, the the unit uh, that the national unit in the capital uh, as well were responsible for for doing the follow up that the team could not no lo- no longer do when they were not there. Mm. But when I talked to them, they said we cannot fulfill this role because we don't we don't. We can't move around the country and we don't have the phone numbers to the police stations. So mm. basic stuff um, that would be very easy to do in another context than, mm. than Haiti. Mm. And yeah, and I will open up for some questions from the audience. Sorry, do you want to say something? No, I'm just no. looking at you. Okay. Um, so, um, but of course, now the situation in Haiti is uh, more desperate than ever. And um, can you just, uh, either if you can just bring us what has happened in recent months. Uh, the, the president was killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now we hear, uh, it seems that violent gangs are in, in control of, of large parts of the capital. There is kidnappings. What, what, is, what is happening? Um, what has happened? Well, compared to when we were there. Yes. Well, one, one of the... Of the um... Of the focus areas of the of the peacekeeping mission uh, was to to strengthen the Haitian National Police and make prepare it for maintaining order and stability once the peacekeeping mission was out. And they that, that actually while they were there, the crime levels um, uh, decreased a bit. It seemed like the the presence of the peacekeeping mission helped create some some kind of uh, of, uh, of stability and, and less violence but the second they left uh, the crime level went up again so it's obvious that uh, the the police was not prepared to to um, to maintain law and order um, themselves uh, and and now after the since then the situation has just deteriorated um, kidnappings are uh, it has become a common part of everyday life. No one is safe. Haitians are more most uh, often targeted, but also foreigners, uh, which has caused uh, international attention. Um, the president was was killed. There's now a uh, uh, power vacuum, um, while the international actors are pushing for election. While the Haitians are saying we are in no, uh, we cannot go uh, and uh, and make do elections in this environment. Um, so everything is very much up in the air, and and uh, in 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 parts of the capital, um, there are thousands of people has been displaced because of gang warfare. So things are just completely out of control. Um, and what is ironic is that uh, when the when the UN mandate ended they said that this is because we have created some kind of stability now and everything is ready for democratic elections and then this uh, happens so uh, the timing is uh, a bit weird i have to say (laughs) and the police force is it operational what to what extent is it the haitian police yes yeah they are but uh uh, I saw they just elected a new Inspector General, mm-hmm. and I don't know how many it's been since I left. Yeah, a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's also a challenge because it's a political political decision to appoint the Inspector General. Mm-hmm. And with that kind of uh, work, it's also money. And of course, the, Haiti has a lot of funding from the international society. Mm-hmm. But Again, it's difficult to see the ambitions and down to the actions on the ground for many things. And even in the police, it's difficult because you, you know they are supported with uh, money around and equipment, but um, it's difficult to find it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and now after the UN leaves uh, a mission area, normally they give most of the equipment to the local police or the NGOs, computers, cars, mm-hmm. uh, buildings. Uh, but... As soon as they have him, I, I don't say they do it, but we all know it's a, it's a big value in the items that they, they, the UN leaves behind. Mm. So it creates another market for which is difficult to, to control. And uh, I also had a contact some days ago with the, with the ULCS, or we say the ULCS, the SGBV unit. Um, and it's kind of desperate. Mm. Uh, they are working, but it's difficult times. Mm. Uh, 
if I start to ask more questions, I believe that they think I'm controlling again. Mm. How are you doing? And then it stops. Mm. Was it difficult for them to, to answer? Mm. Uh, I feel I'm going into the self-respect of a police officer in, in Haiti. And uh, it's kind of, I, I met really many wonderful people and strong people. And I believe they are kind of uh, survivors in a way that we would never have survived in Haiti. Mm. How we are used to live. Mm. But they survive. Mm. And, and they even smile at you when you work together with them. So it, it's a strong people used to a lot of challenges. Mm. I mean, um, the kind of drivers of this, we haven't really talked about that, but um, the drivers of this kind of violence, I mean, um, sexual and gender-based violence, is there any sense of what, what that is? I mean, assume gang violence must be part of it. Mm -hmm. Is it mostly, um, you know, domestic violence or what, from where you see it, what, what is the biggest... Um, uh, types of cases and the drivers of, of this violence? Well, uh, yeah, it's, uh, gangs has a lot, lot to do with them with this because they, they use uh, sexual and gender-based violence as a, as a tool to, to create fear among the population and also to, to mark their territory and they use it as a, yeah, as a tool for warfare, basically. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there's also a history of using rape as a political tool by different paramilitary groups mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in, in Haiti. So like the woman's body has been like almost this battlefield where things have played out. But what has happened uh, during the past decades is that sexual and gender violence has gained a lot of uh, attention, mm -hmm. both from um, international actors and from domestic actors. So when people talk about violence, violence against women in Haiti, rape is the first thing that comes up. Mm -hmm. So it has really become like high up on the agenda. While domestic violence is still very much a taboo that people don't talk much mm -hmm. about, and I don't think they have legislation on it either. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, um, yeah, sexual and gender violence is uh, like the first um, type of gender-based violence in a way uh, to, to, to uh, gain attention in Haiti. Mm -hmm. If, if I should compare with our society, it will take them some decades to come where we are now. Mm. If you look into other parts of the society in Haiti, and uh, it's, uh, it's sad because they have the education, they have you no know, internet helps in, in poor places because everybody is having a telephone or mm. smartphone. Mm. So everybody can easily, and, and YouTube in Haiti is, is a big, uh, they, they read and see everything in, in the YouTube. Uh, so the, the, they know what, what's going on. And, um, but, the, but the challenge, I would say that Norway really uh, hit the bullseye uh, with a specialized team or what they didn't know in, in 2010 would be a specialized team. Mm. Uh, because the, the after action on the earthquake was a lot of displaced children. Mm. And uh, we know uh, who's going to exploit the children or that is a big industry. Mm. So that Norway put some small pocket money really in, in our budget, sending some few people. We are not more than, we're not talking about more than 46 Norwegian officers, 50-50, mm. 23 ladies and 23 men, or 23, uh, giving this is kind of pocket money, what we have done uh, in the nine years. Mm. Uh, so, so I think the result is, yeah, even... Uh, I'm certain of reading the report, but it's, it's not very surprisingly that it goes like this mm. in that surroundings. Mm. Mm. We have a question on the screen. Um, and I think also Elling has a question here in the audience. Let me read it out if my eyes are good enough. Thank you for an interesting insight from your work in Haiti. Um, I had the pleasure of, sorry, I have to go closer actually, of meeting several of your police colleagues over the years in Port-au-Prince. Um, I wanted to ask you, what would be the results that you're most proud of during the project lifetime? And maybe what didn't work uh, and as you had planned initially and why? I guess that question goes to you, Jarle. Uh, yeah, <laughs> most proud of, uh, it's like complex because the, as I said earlier, that Norway actually put some pressure on, on, on having this specialized team. We've seen the aftermath of uh, 
the Haiti project that now it's uh, starting a fire within the UN. More and more countries want to go that way. And I, it's not because I've been there, but because I've been in other mission where I missed the specialized team. So I would say that we actually had the specialized team, had it uh, functioning, um, kind of a model for other missions. And then again, when you see the specialized team, what they can do, it will end up with maybe to, to, to leave Haiti behind with the fully equipped office, with the officers, proud, uh, 10 of them just coming back from education in uh, Canada. Even though if it's a small number, it costs some, some small pocket money again. Um, and the last, I would say that <clears throat> the workshop, because this is what we told them they can do by themselves. It doesn't cost much money. They have meeting rooms. They live in the same town. They can just meet up and decide. Mm -hmm. And I know because the, all of the, or maybe not all, but most of the, the 10 cities, they create a WhatsApp group. And I follow the, 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 the pace of the messages going around and the pictures and the movies. And uh, they're really into it. And that is like we have a SLT in in Bergen or uh, different roles within the community in, in Bergen working together in one platform. Um, I many times thought that I should have started the same in Bergen, a workshop to how to work together mm. on different uh, topics. Because we are so educated, with the, we are specialized in, in different fields mm. sitting in our own office. Yeah, and... Um, what didn't work? I think we spent too much time challenging our own system, meaning the UN system. That was a big disappointment, that, uh, that the UN couldn't lean more forward and applaud it instead of challenge it. Um, Were there something that you then weren't happy about? Or? Ah. Pros and cons about that, I guess. <laughs> now, maybe it's wrong to say, but I hope it's better for the other specialized team mm -hmm. as being part of the mission. But I, I know some people being in Mali and South Sudan, and I, I can feel some of the same challenge. Mm -hmm. and, and that is, it is kind of, uh, if you're not into change, everything is difficult. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, Elling, uh, uh, you had a question? Yeah, Thank you. It was a very interesting uh, conversation you had. Uh, I don't know anything about Haiti or your operations there, but I'm left with uh, a big question, and that is why? Why is the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations and its peacekeeping missions? doing this is it the right instrument uh the un peace department of peacekeeping they have missions sort of all over africa and elsewhere as well what these missions have in common is that they operate in countries where there's hardly a functioning police force or a military force weak civilian institutions uh, and so on and there is a desperate need to build those institutions to get an effective uh, police force to get civilian ministries, departments up and running, you name it. Uh, but then is the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations and its missions a good instrument to build institutions? Uh, I'm very much in favor of peacekeeping missions mm -hmm. of the small police component there and so on. You're doing a great job in the context. But isn't it a bit uh, misguided to also give yourself the task of building institutions? Are there perhaps not other UN agencies that could do this much better or better equipped to do the long-term uh, dedication that it takes to build up institutions? Thank you. That's a rather existential question. <laughs> if you answer that, and then I'll take one more question from Salah. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I know about many options. Maybe it's a, it's a weak answer, but uh, uh, the options for these countries are really difficult. And um, what I've seen where I've been is that it is possible to work together, but 
as you say, it's also difficult to identify all the people working on the on the different topics, merging it into the same focus, because one year go fast when everything takes uh, too long time. But my experience both in Kosovo, Liberia, and in Haiti is that we have a great impact on, uh, but it's the totality of the society or the country that that is too weak, maybe, that it will sustain. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure, I am i haven't read that many books like uh, Mariana, so maybe you can uh, <laughs> take over from here. I'll leave it to you to decide the future of the I read <laughs> many books. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that's a, a good question, Ellen. Uh, and well, one of the things I, I was thinking about when writing this report and when doing the research was this should be a joint effort by not just a peacekeeping um, uh, uh, mission but also the other UN agencies on the ground because there's no cooperation. Uh, you have now you have the, the the UN peacekeepers have left but you still have UNDP you still have UN women uh, but they're doing their own thing and and instead of building on the framework that the specialized police team has set up at continuing strengthening, following up, uh, uh, engaging uh, NGOs and continuing on the workshops and all of that, because the, their interests are the same to combat sexual and gender-based violence. Mm. Uh, but still, they they don't know about these efforts almost. Uh, so, so that's something I think would really help to to uh, to get more to more cooperation between the the UN agencies that are still on the ground. But that was also part of the focus uh, my year, or it will it will always be the focus within the EU and to identify the uh, the other stakeholders because we know that we need support, and we know it's a lot of agency around. Uh, but again, uh, if you operationalize the the mandate, the mission mandate from the UN headquarters in another way, more ambition task, I think it would be easier. Uh, and, and the actually signer of the mission mandate should be able to know which uh, office is into this task and this task, instead of, of leaving it into the ground in Haiti, into the camp, uh, and, and leave it for us to identify which one to cooperate with now. Mm. It's coming from the big building in New York down to the small camp in Haiti, and then I need to restart the thinking which all those people in New York had. So I believe in it still, um, because I haven't really see, seen some uh, good options. Sala, you had a question? That will be the last one. Thank you so much. What a fascinating morning practice seminar. Um, I have worked with the UN on the field and regional and headquarter levels, and I very much understand these tensions that you're talking about, that it feels that these people don't understand one another from different locations, even when working in the same organization. But I, what I actually wanted to touch more upon and ask you, Jarle, is, is this really fascinating notion that you made that uh, often UN comes into the context and says, what is the problem, rather than trying to understanding what is the problem. Mm. So, for example, I've also been to Liberia and there's lots of these kind of tribal and black magic understandings when it comes to sexual and gender based violence. Mm. So, for example, having visited Monrovia Central Prison must be a familiar place for you as well. Yeah. So the same day they had brought in a guy who had raped a two month old baby mm -hmm. in, with the belief that this will cure his AIDS, uh, HIV. Uh, so, in a sense, how did you tap into this kind of local context knowledge in Haiti? Uh, and, for example, within these workshops, what kind of intelligence did you gather and how and how did you opera operationalize that within your within your work? I think the, uh, the experience from, um, so from Liberia was the direct course why we had a workshop in Haiti. I was lucky to work with a, a Swiss guy in, in uh, Liberia. Uh, he went to church every Sunday, a local church. I uh, went together with him. And from the conversation we had with the, with the priest, we uh, had the understanding what is challenging in this area. So then more or less, we decided to go around in different areas in, within Monrovia, where I were the Monrovia commander and head of the UN police uh, on the ground. 
uh, facing the nine police districts within the, the, the capital. So we just decided to go around and ask, uh, not tell, and they told us what were the challenges. So we had a lot of uh, precise challenge from the priest, from the, the mayor, different actors, the police chief uh, also, and we collected them uh, maybe under the tree, the shadow tree, just to have a discussion and listen to them instead of telling them. And then we went back to the headquarters in, in Monrovia, discussing with our people, the, the local police, if we could build any human rights project, if we could do something on this, and, and giving the, 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 the people in the area back what they asked for. Because some area was motorcycle gangs, uh, robbing, rape, many places, robbery, killings. Also, it, it was different topics. If you understand how we did, maybe uh, I'm still Norwegian up here, so but I can listen. English is coming out. Uh, it's a, uh, it's kind of going to them and listen to them. It, it's the, the simplicity in it, and when we have listened to them, we know what we could do for them with our tools, and we know how we can maybe work together with the local police. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, football matches because they were saying that gangs uh, played football and when they uh, left things there, it was robbery around. So we ending up playing football with the robbers because they, they were kind of finding the challenging, interesting, those white people. We're going to play them. And things like that. And that was the same in Haiti with the SGB. Of course, it's a much more serious challenge. But uh, as you write in your report, when the Wudu priests were telling us that I didn't know what to do. So I, I treated the, the, the girls in my way. Mm -hmm. But now I understand I can go to the police chief, uh, the hospital director, and, uh, and um, what was it, the Catholic or priest of some religion? He said that, oh, it's not rape. If you, if you rape your wife, because we are married. He said the first day, but the day he left, the other people in the room, they really uh, kicked his ass. <laughs> and he understood that was not the right opinion. So he changed in two days. And by talking to his, the, the people in his, the same community as him, not by having Yale saying, yes, it is rape. So, so having this, uh, getting all these different actors from the local community and having this uh, Haitian strong female judge leading the conversation, I think was a very good uh, idea to make it sound less like, like lecturing and actually identify the real problems uh, on the ground in, in Haiti. But the biggest challenge about this, I had a kind of a project overstay, which is the same in Liberia. If you spend more than 48 hours in prison, you should be going to a, or presented for a judge. Of course they didn't, because they couldn't, where the, the judge is not there. The hours goes and, and they have different means of, of getting food and other. And the, but my biggest challenge was how to report on this. And that was the same with the workshop, how to report. It, it's, so, it's so much simplicity in how we do it that it's just basic of living. And it's difficult to report that back to the UN headquarters where they expect a big report big result, but people understand it. And that's my meaning. Even the officers working on it understand it means like that. Uh, and then you meet people on their own level. I, I'm not saying that the academics or, or the big reports is not important, but if every time I find a report, I, I look for the last pages and I'm looking for where's the task, what to do. I, I can see you have a lot of uh, words here, but what to do? And that's uh, more or less my year in Haiti. I asked my people or the team or everybody we worked with what to do. What is the task? What is the impact on this? Blah, blah, blah. No, you, this, is, <laughs> this is exactly the question <laughs> that is so difficult to answer for academics as well. <laughs> yeah. um, I think we, we ran out of time, uh, but Yala and Mariana, thank you so much. I feel like we haven't heard uh, uh, the last words on this topic from either of you, uh, something that I think is 
can be explored in the future, both in Haiti and mm. in other settings. Um, and thank you for a very interesting um, uh, inputs and, and reflections from, from both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.